week in Alberta, um, I don't mind telling you that I want an easy Christian faith. Anybody say, yeah, that's me too. <laughs> I want an easy Christian faith, man. I don't want troubles, I don't want difficulties. I, I don't wanna have to live through challenges. In fact, if I was being really honest, you know, the whole kind of name it and claim it version of Christianity that's out there is very appealing, right? You know, the idea that God just wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy all the time, that's appealing. It's not biblical, Um, (laughs) but but it's appealing. I understand. I understand why it's there, and we're we're gonna confront this reality uh, in our text uh, together this morning. I mean, who would say no if, if following Jesus was just kind of like this list of perks that, uh, hey, come to Jesus and he's gonna give you a fancy car and you know, big house and place by the lake and lots of vacation time to enjoy it all. And, you know, but, but the reality is that the signing up to follow Jesus is not this like, list of benefits. It's not like joining Costco. Um, <laughs> that that you, know, you sign on and here are the benefits that you get. Um, uh, it's not that kind of proposition at all. And, and, and let me say, if you have nice things, thank you Jesus for that. Uh, he has entrusted some of you with wealth uh, and, and he invites you to steward that wisely for his kingdom purposes. God's not against wealth. He just doesn't guarantee it for every follower of, of Jesus. Um, and, and in that kind of sobering statement, let me, let me invite you to hear and he loves you immensely. Man, he loves you. Um, And he's inviting you into a life of following him um, that has meaning and purpose both now and through eternity. Um, So that's kind of the slap in the face as we go into the first uh, half of the Gospel of Mark chapter six. Um, and here's where we're going this morning. Uh, be, being a disciple of Jesus will be costly. That, that's what Mark has for us to hear. It will be costly. Will you follow him anyway? Being a disciple of Jesus will be costly. Will, will you follow him anyway? Uh, this morning we're gonna look at the faithless Nazarenes and, and the invitation to uh, lay down um, our pride and prejudice. Not the book. <laughs> But, but, but to lay down the, the, that which has become so familiar that there's almost disdain to it. Uh, we're gonna look at the, the faithful disciples. That's gonna be a fun part of the conversation, this invitation to try again. Trust Jesus again, like even w- when you've failed the first time. Um, and, and we're gonna look at the failed faith of, of Herod um, and this invitation to abandon wickedness. So, so follow along as I read. I'm in... Um, I'm in the Gospel of Mark chapter six. I'm gonna read from the New Living Translation. I'm gonna start at verse one. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath he began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives, his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went from village to village teaching the people and he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, uh, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals but not to take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome you to, or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So the disciples went out, telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. 
Herod Antipas, the king, soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That is why he can do such miracles. Others said, he's the prophet Elijah. Still others said, he's a prophet like the other great prophets of the past. When Herod heard about Jesus, he said, John, the man I beheaded has come back from the dead. For Herod had sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John as a favor to Herodias, his wife. He had been his brother Philip's wife, but Herod had married her. John had been telling Herod, it's against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. So Herodias bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But without Herod's approval, she was powerless. For Herod respected John, and knowing that he was a go, he liked to listen to him. Herodias' chance finally came on Herod's birthday. He gave a party for his high government officials, army of officers, and the leading citizens of Galilee. Then his daughter, also named Herodias, came in and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guests. Ask me for anything you like, the king said to the girl, and I will give it to you. He even vowed, I will give you whatever you ask, up to half my kingdom. She went out and asked her mother, what should I ask for? Her mother told her, ask for the head of John the Baptist. So the girl hurried back to the king, told him, I want the head of John the Baptist right on a tray. Then the king deeply regretted what he had said. But because of the vows he had made in front of his guests, he couldn't refuse her, so he immediately sent an executioner to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. The soldiers beheaded John in the prison, brought his head on a tray, and gave it to the girl who took it to her mother. When John's disciples heard what had happened, they came to get his body and buried it in a tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. This is the word of the Lord. May he help us understand it. Holy Spirit, if you would teach us this morning, uh, we would be so grateful. There's a lot we could talk about here, um, but we'll start with this. Let's kind of go back to that beginning bit and and, and these faithless Nazarenes. It says they scoffed at Jesus. They were deeply offended and refused to believe. And it says that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Now remember, throughout this series in the Gospel of Mark, we've been trying to hear. We've been trying to hear uh, the Gospel tell us the story of Jesus uh, as it was first heard. Okay, first century Israel uh, was at least 70% illiterate. So so the vast majority of people heard about Jesus before they would ever read about Jesus. And we're pretty sure that the Gospel of Mark was one of those documents that was intended to be heard. It was brought to a community, uh, an orator would deliver it to them, uh, possibly in one long sitting, two and a half hours maybe or so, to read through that Gospel. And the telling of the story of Jesus uh, was crafted very carefully, wisely, with memorable segments so that you you could kind of hang on to some hooks in in the midst of the story. And and I say all of that, and we think that must be impossible only because we have become very poor listeners. Um, They, on the other hand, were very good listeners. If you don't have literacy, uh, you've got to find ways to tuck it away and remember it. And a preliterate society had extraordinary capacities to remember accurately what they were told. It means that if we're going to listen the way they heard, we need to listen carefully. We, we need to, to be intentional and listen hard. So, Holy Spirit, would you open our ears this morning that we would hear? Would you uh, enable our minds to to put some categories together that indeed would be memorable and we would be able to hold on to it faithfully. We ask in the name of Jesus. So we've been talking about Jesus' use of parables, right? And then the last couple of Sundays, we reviewed Mark's claim that Jesus is Lord. He's Lord even over the forces of nature, over the forces of evil in the demonic world. Uh, Jesus uh, demonstrated authority o- over severe, life altering long-term illness. Uh, Jesus even demonstrates authority over death itself. And, and we've, we've observed different responses, uh, different faith responses, uh, from, from no faith to new faith, to, to a secret but certain faith, uh, to, to, to the instruction, just have faith. 
And that faith thread continues into Mark chapter six. Uh, It tells us that Jesus returned to the town that he grew up in. I've wondered whether or not this is, uh, you know, why high school reunions are just a bad idea, right? (laughs) I I don't know what your experience has been. Uh, But but in this case, uh, they've pigeonholed Jesus uh, based on his family of of origin. Um, Then, even more so than now, Uh, The situation that you were born into defined your station in life, right? Jesus was getting above his raisin, as Ricky Skaggs used to sing, right? Who does he think he is, right? Teaching and preaching and healing and messing with those demons and stuff. And and yet there's so much more going on here than than just local boy getting kind of full of himself. And, And then this most extraordinary statement Um, in in verse five. Because of their unbelief, Jesus couldn't do any miracles among them. Say what? Right? Jesus has just demonstrated he has authority over the the forces of nature. He has authority over this demonic horde of demons. Uh, But he doesn't exercise authority over the unbelief of the people of Nazareth. They're gonna have to make a choice here. These are his homies. This is the people, these are the people he grew up with. Now, now in the telling of the Gospel of Mark, this is gonna foreshadow the unbelief of the people of Israel at large. They're, he's broadly gonna be rejected. But don't miss the personal challenge and the corporate challenge that's here for us. My willingness to trust Jesus for what I need is connected to his ability to deliver it. My ability to trust Jesus for what I need is is connected to his ability to deliver it to me. Those who needed rescue, we've encountered this in the text already, those who needed rescue from uh, the the, the horrific storm, they got it because they asked. Uh, The demoniac was delivered from uh, the, the, the horrific abuse he was experiencing because he ran to Jesus and fell at the feet of Jesus. Uh, the, the woman who was bleeding for 12 years thought, if I just touch the edge of his robe, I will be healed. Uh, the, the dad, Jairus, he came, he asked, and then he waited. He waited. Like, having to believe, being put into a place of believing Jesus for the impossible. Uh, last Sunday we talked about this, this historic uh, conception that, that, that faith is, is knowing, uh, but it's also surrendering, and, and then it's trusting. It, it's knowing, it, it's, it's who am I trust, who, who's my faith in? It, it's, it's surrendering. I will lay down my expectations of him and let God be God, and I will trust. Faith is trusting. Uh, Faith is not faith in faith, so that's not what's going on here. It's not like just gather me a little more of this faith stuff. It's not a commodity that I can put in my bucket. Um, This is about faith in a person, and and his name is Jesus, and he is the only place worthy of anchoring your life. People of Nazareth were not willing to uh, believe or trust or, or, or anchor their faith in Jesus. They needed to lay down their pride, uh, their prejudice, their prejudgments against Jesus, the familiarity, the, the, the word familiar even has family in, in, as its root. Uh, this, this was an obstacle to faith that each and every one of us is gonna be confronted with. But by contrast, Mark tells us about the disciples, which this is a refreshing story. The, the, the faithful disciples. Haven't you longed to hear those two words put together? Faithful disciples? Like it was just a few verses ago, back in the end of chapter four, when Jesus said, why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? And, and now, just a little further on, he's, willing, he's able to work with what, he, what he's got. 
Jesus here is sending them out to, what he, to do what he himself was doing. Let, let's look at verse, the second half of verse six again. Then Jesus went from village to village, teaching the people, and he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. <laughs> like straight into the deep end, right? right? Hey guys, go kick some demon butt, <laughs> right? Like, there's no easing them into it. It's straight into the major leagues, or at least that's the way it looks like, you know, as you're reading your way through the text. I was in my first year of pastoral ministry, and I was confronted with the demonic and had to do something about it. Uh, This year marks our 30th year, Ann and I, in in pastoral ministry. So it was a couple years ago. Uh, First year, I was was leading worship, and, and, and one of the girls on our worship team was behaving very, very strangely. Long story short, um, Ann and I took her aside and spent several hours with her and ultimately doing exactly what Jesus has described here. Uh, It's an experience that I've had many times over the last 30 years. And there have been times when I'm like, I think I'm in over my head here. Like, you know, call for reinforcements. Somebody needs to pray harder. You know, so I, need, I need somebody else in the body of Christ with a gift of discernment because I'm not sure what to do next. Um, the body of Christ working together. But, but, but notice, notice that what Jesus is doing is he's, this is not about me, it's not about you, it's not about his disciples. It was about Jesus and his authority. It was an authority that he had and was then able, is able, does delegate. He he gives that authority to his disciples to, 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 uh, to walk forward and do his work in his way, bringing the rescue that he invites to be brought into people's lives. By the time we get to the end of the Gospel of Mark, Um, Here's what it looks like. This is Mark's version of the Great Commission. We'll talk about this verse in more detail eventually. But chapter six, verse 15. Uh, Pardon me, chapter 16, verse 15. And then Jesus told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Okay, so that sounds familiar, right? Matthew chapter 28. Um, This is Mark's version. Preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety and they will drink anything, if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Now, I don't know about you, but it sounds like Jesus has got us covered. Like, like he is inviting us to move forward and do his work, trusting that he is gonna show up with what is needed in the moment that we show up. Okay, I, he's not saying go out and play with snakes, and he's not saying go out and purposely drink poison. But if and when you find yourself in the worst situation imaginable, look to Jesus. He's the one who sent me here. He's the one who will keep me here. He's the one who has given me his authority and that's what I need to ask for in this moment. Now, you you may have also noticed that Jesus sent these guys out without luggage. That seems almost a little bit unreasonable. Um, But he's like, okay, go. You can take the walking stick and sandals and one set of clothes, but no bag, no money, no, right? And, and, And there's a part of this which is, um, it's, it's a universal fact, like, like Jesus is gonna send you. If you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus sends you. Uh, Jesus sends me, he says go. There's this universal go. And then there's a specific instruction that was for these guys at this point in time. No luggage was it here. I suspect what's going on here is he's testing their faith. He's saying, look, can you trust me? You're just going out for a couple days. Can you trust me uh, that, that the, what's gonna be required is gonna be provided for you? Test of faith. Uh, we've had a fairly recent example where their faith didn't kind of endure the test. Uh, Let me read it for you again. Verse eight, chapter six. Then he told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick. Uh, No no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals but not to take a change of clothes. So so this is part, uh, so so the, the people in town of Nazareth, um, were faithless, 
Uh, they needed to lay down pride and prejudice, uh, the prejudgments. Uh, they needed to, to lay down that which was familiar in, in order to look at Jesus again. I mean, here, here the disciples have to pick up the invitation to try again, to trust. You know, can you trust me with this much, for this much? Will you trust? Verse 12, we read this. So the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. Do you remember that? Mark chapter one. Okay, okay, this is the summary of the gospel that Mark has given us back. So, so now they are going and doing exactly what Jesus has been doing. Repent of their sins and turn to God. And, the cast, and, to, and they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. I think that last little bit's funny. Olive does not appear in the original Greek. It's just oil. But of course, no one in first century Israel was going to say like, 5W30 or 10W30? <laughs> you know, which motor oil? You know, clean motor oil or used motor oil? Which, no, it's just olive oil. It's just olive oil. And then we get to this next strange section, and I'll be honest, I've read this over the years, like through my lifetime, and I thought, why did Mark include that? Like, like why all of a sudden this insertion of the account about Herod and the execution of John the Baptist here. I've always felt like it felt a little out of place. But the answer is, it's part of the sandwich. It's part of the sandwich. Verse six tells us that Jesus sent the disciples out. Verse 30 tells us that the disciples returned. And they returned with an account of everything that happened. Now if that's all that we had, they went, it went, super smooth, everything was cool, and they came back. Well, we, we might think that following Jesus is just always going to be easy, right? Uh, uh, he sends, we go, he blesses, we return. I like that version of it. But then insert into the middle of the sandwich this account of Jesus' disciple, John the Baptist. Now, I know he wasn't one of the 12, and I know he wasn't even one of the 72 but he was clearly one who had put his faith in Jesus. Are you the promised one who's come? Yes, I'm the promised one. And, and John walked out that faith. And for John, completing the work that God had given him meant martyrdom. John would die as part of his assignment. Following Jesus isn't, isn't always gonna be easy. He died because a, a weak, need, morally bankrupt politician failed to do his job, became an unjust leader, and that was what was going on there. So let's look at the failed faith of Herod. I'm not gonna read that whole sordid affair again. It was difficult enough the first time. But Herod's was, the, the, the Herods were a series of, of leaders in ancient Israel who were astoundingly evil. So, so we encountered, you know, Herod back at Christmas. Uh, that was referring to Herod the Great, we call him, because of the, the great structures that he built. He was a horrific human being. Um, but he built, you know, the, the fortress of Masada, and he, he built a, a stunning... Um, Port at Caesarea Philippi. You can still visit that today. We'll visit it in the fall if you're able to join me. Uh, Jerusalem, he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, he did so on the back of, 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 of cruelly abused slaves. Um, if you recall the account in Matthew where he murdered uh, all of the little boys around Bethlehem in his search for, uh, for Jesus. Well, that's just one of dozens of examples of what a vile human being he was. And his sons were not much better. After Herod the Great's death, uh, I think that was 4 BC or something like that, um, his, his sort of kingdom area was divided up and different sons took different parts, uh, at least for a little while. And, and, and the stories of their pride and their arrogance and their lavish indulgences and their moral bankruptcy is a long tale to tell. Herod Antipas is the one we meet here. Um, he was never actually called king. I suspect that Mark, for the first century listeners, they heard him called king and they chuckled <laughs> because he didn't last very long. In fact, he wanted to be king and that was about the time he got the boot. But, 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 but maybe you heard the overtones of this here. Herod Antipas, he reminds us of, does it remind you of, of the Persian king Xerxes? Remember the story of, of Esther? 
this lavish party, the lewd dancing, uh, the ridiculous boast, whatever you want, I'll give it up, up to half my kingdom. He doesn't look like a king, certainly not a king of Israel. He, he looks like a foreign king, somebody who does not belong, in contrast to Jesus. And what about his, his wife Herodias? Maybe you maybe even caught the overtones of this. Like she sounds like that wicked, horrific Queen Jezebel uh, from, from the book of Kings, right? Abuse of power, willingness to step on anyone who dares cross her. And how about them parent, parenting skills, right? <laughs> go get me the head of John the Baptist. Yeah, go dance for dad's crowd. Like just insanity, and, and this is the moral bankruptcy of this family, and yet, and yet there's an account here of God's grace toward Herod Antipas. Like there was a window of opportunity for a spiritual breakthrough in his life and he missed it. Let me read it for you again, verse 19. So Herodias bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but without Herod's approval she was powerless, for Herod respected John. Remember John's the forerunner, he went before the Messiah, the herald uh, who was like Elijah. And knowing that he was good, knowing that John was a good and a holy man, he protected him, Herod was greatly disturbed. Remember this, I mean, yes, he was that, but greatly disturbed whenever he talked with John, but even so, he liked to listen to him. Greatly disturbed. That, 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 that's what we're talking about there, is, that's called conviction. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. When God disturbs you, when the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, is disrupting you, bringing conviction of sin, you know, your, your unacceptable actions and attitudes didn't used to bother you. But, but, but all of a sudden, something has changed. Maybe you're in church this morning and you're hearing the Holy Spirit speak to you. Something's gotta change. Uh, maybe you have never yielded to that and he's giving you an opportunity yet again. Something's got to change. This is opportunity knocking, my friend. This is, this is a window of time when real change is possible. And all of us, for all of us, following Jesus will be costly. Herod was unwilling to pay the price. He would have to abandon extreme wickedness it would have revo required radical change, but the reality is that same radical change is necessary in, in my life, and it's necessary in your life. It's a radical change of, of how I think. It's a change of what I do. It's a change of, of how I feel, like, like, like where my heart is inclined towards. We would describe it when talking about discipleship as head, heart, and hands. What are you learning? I have things to learn about Jesus. What are you doing? I have things that I need to do and just take that next right step in agreement with Jesus. And, and, and what am I feeling? What, what, are the, what are the things that are stirring in my heart and are they godly things or do they need to be corrected? Do they need instruction from God's word? So we've looked at the, the account, the story of the folks in Nazareth, the, the disciples. We've looked at the account of, of Herod. Where do you find yourself in, in, in the story? like the faithless Nazarenes. I mean, many of us have been though, that. Many of us have found Jesus just to be familiar and everyday and ordinary, and maybe you're at that place right now. And, and, and this is an invitation to wake up and say Jesus is anything but ordinary. His call is anything but pedestrian. Uh, it's this, uh, this invitation to abandon your pride Humble yourself before Jesus. It's an invitation to abandon your prejudgments, your prejudice against Jesus, what he ought to do, what he should do. The Nazarenes rejected Jesus, and many of us have done the same until Jesus brings us to the place where we're prepared to lay it down. For, for, some, of, for some of us, it's our children, right? Uh, they have, uh, they've rejected or are rejecting the familiar in favor of, of the novel, like Jesus is old school. Uh, perhaps, they, perhaps they're judging the failings of the church. They're real, they are real. Um, maybe they're judging your failings as a parent, 
or as a grandparent, right? If Jesus can't fix mom, can't fix dad, what good is he? Uh, if this is as good as the church can be, what's the point? And these are real problems and we need to do real work on each and every one of them. However, the problem that I just recounted is a problem with Christians, not with Christ. It, it's, it's a disciple problem, not a Jesus problem. And, and we ought never ask our children or our grandchildren or our friends or our neighbors to look at us as the example of, of, of faith. We've gotta ask them to do what we alone can do and that is to look to Jesus. He's the only one worthy of looking at. The best I can ever do, Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow me as I follow Jesus. Don't follow the parts where I get it wrong. Are you like a faithless Nazarene? Abandon your pride and your prejudice. I hope all of us can identify with the faithful disciples, right? Th those that Jesus continues to train by sending us on mission that we're not ready for and then bringing us back to hear what's taking place and then he sends us out and he says, okay, go do it again. Here we go, try again, trust me. I am with you always to the ends of the earth. This is your testimony, right? Like, like just go with your testimony uh, of God's faithfulness to me. Here's what I know. Or, or, or maybe you're able to go with the, the account of the 12 disciples telling people to repent of their sins. Turn to God. Turn to God. You can trust him. Turn to God. Verse 13, they cast out many demons and healed many sick people and anointed them with oil. Did you know hospitals exist because of Jesus? Heal the sick, he said. And early Christians said, okay, let, let, let's do what we can. And the first hospitalities, the first hospitals uh, were the result of Christians walking in obedience, doing the best they could with this. I'm not saying that Jesus is, is only talking about natural healing here, but it is included. And, and so if you are a doctor or a nurse or a psychologist or a chiropractor or somebody who's working in the healing arts, you're doing what Jesus sent his disciples out to do, to minister, to care. Uh, with compassion uh, to represent Jesus. Are, are you a faithful disciple? Hear Jesus inviting you. Let's go again. Let's go again. Trust me. Now, now, of course, none of us want to be the failed faith of Herod kind of people, right? Like nobody wants that around their neck. But to avoid doing that, you have to do something with the conviction when the Holy Spirit stirs and, and, and begins to speak to you. We heard what to do with it. The disciples have said it already in our text. Repent of your sins and turn to God. I was reading about St. Patrick this week when he was 16 years old. Some of you maybe read the same stories. Uh, Patrick was abducted by Irish pirates taken from England to Ireland and enslaved harsh labor conditions. And it was under that harsh place that he turned. To, he repented of his sin and turned to God. Here's what I found interesting. He used, the, he used the words converting to Christianity. And I find it curious because his dad was a deacon in the church, his grandfather had been a minister, um, and yet he used the term converting to Christianity. Have you converted to Jesus? Have you converted to Jesus? Every one of us has to. Like, if you were born in a garage that doesn't make you a car, born in a Christian household does not make you a Christian. Um, so, so I've got to convert from my, uh, I'm probably good enough for God, thinking. You're not. Uh, no sin at all can enter his presence. You've got, you got to deal with it. You gotta convert from your, God's, God's nice, and everyone, everyone will be accepted by him thinking. He certainly is nice. But, but sin and God, gasoline and fire, my friends, cannot coexist. You gotta convert from my he owes me something kind of thinking. You gotta repent from the judgments that we, we tend to make over God. If he... If he were truly good, he would, and you fill in the blank. If there's a God, then surely he would, and I fill in the blank. And, and humanity stand in judgment over the one 
who knows and sees all and judges rightly. We're converting from and turning our back on and we're repenting towards Jesus. And yes, he is good. Yes, he is loving. Yes, he is kind. And yes, he forgives sin. But you must acknowledge yours if you're going to be forgiven it. Will you? I wanna invite the worship team to come. Uh, They're gonna come and, and, and lead us in response this morning, but maybe you would stand with me. And let me invite you to bow with me in prayer. Maybe this morning you need to pray something like this. Oh God, I come to you in confession of my sin. List what you're aware of, friends. I come in confession of my sin. Lord Jesus, I come converting from the old and turning to you. Please straighten out my distorted view of you, O God. This morning I'm turning to you. Please save me. Now I ask you to help me to begin to walk like a disciple, following you, learning from you, obeying you. And when I fail, to take your hand and try again, trusting you. Lord Jesus, we ask this because of what you have done Therefore, we pray this in your name.